Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Pytel. Today's topic of discussion is timers and the on delay function. Our objective is to introduce timers, perform a brief orientation to common timing functions, examine the on delay function at some depth, and put it to use in some illustrated examples. Throughout the course of this playlist, you've heard me refer to timers and mention applications befitting synchronization and coordination with respect to time. However, we've yet to really examine the device that makes this technique possible, the timer. Timers, sometimes called timer relays, are control devices with associated contacts that, depending on the chosen function, exhibit a temporal shift between the assertion of the controlling input and activation or deactivation of the associated contacts. Consider a regular, ordinary control relay with a coil and a set of associated single-pole double-throw transfer contacts, one side of the single-pole double-throw transfer switch being normally closed, the other side being normally open. When the coil is energized by pilot voltage, the associated contacts quasi-instantaneously change to their activated opposite state. The normally closed contacts open, and the normally open contacts close. When the coil is de-energized, the associated contacts quasi-instantaneously revert to their normal deactivated state. The normally closed contacts reclose, and the normally open contacts reopen. Now consider a timer relay, also with a coil and a set of associated single-pole double-throw transfer contacts. Executing the on-delay function, sometimes called delay on energize, or DOE. When the timer relay coil is energized by pilot voltage, the associated contacts do not respond instantaneously, but only after a predetermined delay period has elapsed. When the coil over the timer relay executing the on delay function is de-energized, the associated contacts quasi-instantaneously revert to their natural deactivated state. The name really says it all. On delay, or delay on energize, mean the contacts transition to their opposite states only after a period of delay of the coil being energized. Such a delayed transition could be used to stop or start another motor a measurable period after another motor is started, among numerous other applications, all serving to coordinate the sequential function of a complicated system. Timing diagrams are often used to show how a group of signals change in relation to one another. A timing diagram of a timer executing the on delay or delay on energize function would look like this. When the controlling input is energized at this instant here, the associated contacts do not immediately switch to their opposite state. The normally closed contact remains closed and the normally open contact remains open. Only after the predetermined delay period, T, has elapsed do the contacts change states here. The normally closed contact opens and the normally open contact closes. When the coil is de-energized here, the associated contacts quasi-instantaneously revert to their normal deactivated state. The normally closed contact recloses, and the normally open contact reopens. If the controlling input was de-energized prior to the delay period T elapsing, the contacts would not change states. Additionally, a regular on-delay function is ordinarily not cumulative in that repeated actuation of the control input for periods less than the delay period do not accumulate over time. We'll examine other common timer functions that exhibit radically different behaviors in later lectures. Before we dive into on-delay timer examples, let's discuss some general timer background information. Timers can be classified by how they determine the delay period. Old school timers called dashbot timers, believe it or not, use the measured flow rate of a liquid or gas through a controlled orifice to determine the delay period. Slightly more advanced timers use mechanical means like a spring-wound clock to determine the delay. These methods, although effective, are hopelessly old school and not in common use today. Most likely, the timers you'll encounter are solid-state devices that use a microchip to determine the delay period. Last but not least, I should mention programmed timer instructions executed by a Programmable Logic Controller, or PLC. Though not a real physical entity, a timer instruction written in a language usable by a PLC is an effective virtual timer and can execute timed operations. We'll discuss timer functions used by PLCs in later lectures. Timers can be further classified into two general categories, single function and multifunction. A single function timer is normally inexpensive. However, as the name implies, performs one function and one function only. 
To set up a single function timer necessitates a technician choose a timer that executes the desired function and then adjust the delay period only. Here's an example of a single function timer that performs only the on delay function. In this case, this single function's timer on delay period is adjustable from 0.5 up to 10 seconds. To set for a delay period of 5 seconds, a technician would rotate the delay period potentiometer to show 5 seconds. Too easy. A multi-function timer, in contrast, can perform several different functions. However, it might be slightly more expensive than a single function timer. A multi-function timer could execute the on delay, off delay, on and off delay, the flash, repeat, or recycle function, rising or falling edge one shots, cumulative on delays, and more. To set up a multifunction timer to execute a particular function of interest, a technician must first choose the correct function and then set the delay period. Note, certain asymmetric timer functions use two independently adjustable time periods, necessitating two delay adjustments. The user selectable functions and delay period are ordinarily adjustable via a potentiometer screw, dial, or thumb wheel. These are examples of the adjustment mechanisms used by multifunction timers. Here's an example of a multifunction timer that can perform eight different functions, A through H. To set this particular multifunction timer to perform the on delay function for a period of five seconds, a technician will rotate the function selector to function A, the on delay function as illustrated in the table. Then a technician would choose the appropriate delay. This particular multifunction timer necessitates a two-step process to adjust the delay period. First, select the range and then adjust the range percentage. The range selection presents possibilities from one second up to 100 hours. The percentage can then be used to fine tune the delay period inside this range. For example, a range of 10 seconds with a percentage of 50% would give a delay of five seconds. Other combinations exist However, this particular combination would allow the finest degree of tuning around the five second region. Note this particular multifunction timer has indicator LEDs that indicate when the coil is energized and when the outputs are in their activated state. You know you set the timer up correctly if you energize the coil, wait five seconds, and then see the output change states. Note when the coil is de-energized, the contacts immediately revert to their deactivated state as we'd expect for an on-delay timer. Troubleshooters take note, a multi-function timer executing the right function at the wrong time needs to have the delay adjusted. In contrast, a multi-function timer executing the wrong function at the right time needs to have the function adjusted. I'd like to say the misinterpretation of functions is a rare occurrence, but it isn't, and you need to be aware of this possibility. Note certain manufacturers include a handy cheat sheet on the side of the timer that graphically illustrates the timing diagrams of available functions. If a timer doesn't have this feature, a technician must consult the data sheet of interest. Additionally, note certain manufacturers go to the trouble of enclosing the adjustable components under a plastic cover, thereby reminding those individuals diddling with the dials they at least better have a reason for doing so. As previously discussed, the on delay function, or delay on energize, delays the transition of the associated contacts a period after the coil has been energized. Ordinarily, the contacts quasi-instantaneously return to their deactivated state after the controlling input has been de-energized for a timer executing the on-delay function. Schematically, timer contacts executing the on-delay function are often illustrated using the symbol for a switch with an arrow modifier illustrating which action is being delayed. Here is the schematic symbol for a normally closed time open contact, often abbreviated NCTO. The contact is drawn normally closed, NC. However, the arrow indicates the timed opening, TO, of the contact is delayed after the coil has been energized for a period. Here is the symbol for a normally open timed closed contact, often abbreviated NOTC. The contact is drawn normally open, NO. However, the arrow indicates the timed closure, TC, of the contact is delayed after the coil has been energized for a period. As helpful and informative as these schematic symbols are, for some reason they've fallen out of favor, 
and you may just see a contact associated with a timer illustrated as a regular normally closed or normally open contact. The ladder logic documentation should inform a reader that the contacts are executing the on delay function. Note, due to the sheer variety of timer functions available, not every function has a handy schematic shorthand equivalent like this. However, I'll try to make use of these symbols for delay on energize contacts since I find them pretty useful. While we're on the subject of contacts, it should be noted that terminal numbering of contacts associated with timer relays uses slight variation on numbering than that regularly employed by normal control relays. Consider a timer relay with a coil on three associated single pole double throw transfer contacts. One side of an associated contact is normally closed time open, the other side is normally open time closed. The coil of a timer relay is traditionally numbered A1 and A2. If the coil has an auxiliary input, it's often identified as aux, b, or in. We'll discuss timer functions that necessitate the use of auxiliary inputs in later lectures. On delay timers, since they're pretty simple, ordinarily don't require an auxiliary input. However, be aware this is a possibility. Again, always consult the datasheet of interest for your particular timer. The first digit of a terminal identifies the associated contact, just like a regular control relay. The second digit identifies the contact's deactivated state. This is where things change a little bit. For a timed single pole double throw transfer switch, 5 identifies the common terminal, a 6 identifies the normally closed side, and an 8 identifies the normally open side. This terminal would be 1-5 since it's the common terminal of the first associated contact. This terminal would be 1-6 since it's the normally closed time open side of the first associated contact. This terminal would be 1-8 since it's the normally open time closed side of the first associated contact. The rest of the terminal numbers would be assigned as follows. For the second switch, it's 2-5, 2-6, 2-8. For the third switch, it's 3536-38. If a timer relay makes use of electrically isolated single pole single throw switches, terminal numbers might use a variation of this same scheme. The first digit of a terminal still identifies the associated contact, however second digit pairing of 5-6 indicates the contact is normally closed, and a second digit pairing of 7-8 indicates the contact is normally open. These terminals would be 1 7 one eight, because it's the first associated contact and it's normally open. These terminals would be two five two six because it's the second associated contact and it's normally closed. The rest of the terminal numbers would be assigned as follows: three five three six for the third switch being normally closed time open, and four seven four eight for the fourth normally open time closed switch. I'm not going to say this switch and terminal numbering methodology compared to regular control relays isn't confusing, because it is. However, the different terminal numbers would identify those contacts that execute time-based shifts and don't respond like regular normally closed and normally open contacts, even if the ladder logic diagram failed to use the schematic shorthand and if the description in any associated documentation escaped your notice. Before we discuss applications of the onDelay function, Let's briefly examine other common timer functions. My intention in doing this walkthrough is not to confuse you, but rather to compare and contrast their behavior with one another. Repeated exposure to this topic is the best tactic because similar terms are employed for different functions and it'd be a horrible mistake to confuse one function for another. Expect me to revisit this exact same walkthrough of common functions every time we have occasion to discuss a new one in depth. Recall that a timing diagram of a timer executing the on delay or delay on energize function would look like this. When the controlling input is energized at this instant here, the associated contacts do not instantaneously switch to their opposite state. The normally closed time open contact remains closed and the normally open time closed contact remains open. Only after the predetermined delay period T has elapsed do the contacts change states here. The normally closed time open contact opens, and the normally open time closed contact closes. When the controlling input is de-energized here, the associated contacts quasi-instantaneously revert to their normal deactivated state. The normally closed time open contact recloses, and the normally open time closed contact reopens. The on-delay timer could be used to turn another motor on a measurable time period after another has started. This is not the only function a timer is capable of executing. Other common functions include, but are not limited to, 
off delay, on and off delay, flash, recycle or repeat, positive or negative edge triggered one shots, and cumulative on delays. Compare this behavior to a timer executing the off delay function. A time and diagram of a timer executing the off delay function, sometimes called a delay on de-energize or DODE, would look like this. When the controlling input is energized at this instant here, the associated contacts quasi-instantaneously switch to their opposite state, just like a regular control relay. The normally closed time closed contact opens, and the normally open time open contact closes. However, when the controlling input is de-energized here, the associated contacts maintain the asserted state. The normally closed time closed contact remains open, and the normally open time open contact remains open. Only after the predetermined delay period T has elapsed do the contacts revert to their deactivated state. The normally closed time closed contact recloses, and the normally open time open contact reopens. Note the different terminology and schematic symbols employed by the off delay in comparison to that of the on delay. They're opposite, as one would expect. An off delay could be used to keep one motor running for a measurable period after you turn another one off. Note for this general purpose orientation, I've purposely simplified the timing diagram of an off delay timer. Compare this behavior to a timer executing the on and off delay function. A timing diagram of a timer executing the on and off delay function would look like this. An on and off delay, as the name implies, executes a combination of the on delay and off delay function. When the controlling input is energized at this instant here, the associated contacts do not immediately switch to their opposite state. The normally closed contact remains closed and the normally open contact remains open. Only after the predetermined delay period T1 has elapsed do the contacts change states here. The normally closed contact opens and the normally open contact closes. This is the on delay portion of the on and off delay function. When the controlling input is de-energized at this instant here, the associated contacts do not immediately switch to their opposite state, but rather maintain their activated state. The normally closed contact remains open, and the normally open contact remains closed. Only after the predetermined delay period T2 has elapsed do the contacts revert to their deactivated state. The normally closed contacts reclose, and the normally open contacts reopen. This is the off delay portion of the on and off delay function. A symmetric on and off delay timer means the on delay and off delay time period are equal to each other. T1 equals T2. To set a symmetric on and off delay timer would necessitate only one delay adjustment. In contrast, an asymmetric on and off delay timer means the on delay and off delay are not equal to each other. T1 does not equal T2. Timers executing an asymmetric on and off delay would require two independently adjustable delay periods. An on and off delay timer could be used to coordinate two motors such that motor B stops a period after motor A starts, then motor B stops a period after motor A stops. Note for this general purpose orientation, I've purposely simplified the timing diagram of the on and off delay timer. Compare this behavior to a timer executing the flash function, sometimes called repeat or recycle. A timing diagram of a timer executing the flash function would look like this. When the controlling input is energized at this instant here, the associated contacts continuously alternate between the activated and deactivated state with a measurable period. Similar to our previous discussion about on and off delay timers, flash function might be symmetric, where the activation period is equal in magnitude to the deactivation period, or asymmetric, where the activation and deactivation periods are independently adjustable. A symmetric flash would necessitate only one adjustment. In contrast, an asymmetric flash would necessitate two adjustment points, one for delay period T1, one for delay period T2. The flash function could be used to create a super annoying warning strobe when a motor is energized, or perhaps timeshare a load between two different motors. Compare this behavior to a timer executing the one-shot function. A timing diagram of a timer executing the one-shot function would look like this. For a positive or rising edge triggered one shot, when the controlling input is energized at this instant here, the associated contacts only temporarily assume the opposite activated state for a period T, and then revert to their deactivated state, despite the controlling input still being energized. 
This would be a rising or positive edge triggered one shot and essentially does exactly what the name suggests and that the one shot function is only enabled once for a period T on a rising or positive going transition of the controlling input. Alternatively, a negative or falling edge triggered one shot is one that the one shot function is only enabled once for a period T on a falling or negative going transition of the controlling input. One shots can be used to assert an output for a desired time period following the energized or de-energized transition of another device. One shots are particularly interesting because manufacturers occasionally include a slew of handy features, including resets and retriggerable versus non-retriggerable one shots. Note for this general purpose orientation, I've purposely simplified the timing diagram for rising and falling edge one shots. Finally, compare this behavior to a timer executing the cumulative on delay function. A cumulative on delay timer is a record keeping function where the timer does not temporarily shift the outputs, but rather keeps track of how long its controlling input has been energized. Only after the controlling input has been asserted for the predetermined period of time, do the outputs respond. Note, despite the controlling input being discontinuously energized, only once the timer has accumulated the required delay period here, do the contacts switch to their activated opposite states. Such a timer could be used to keep track of how long a particular controlling input has been asserted and then alert the system that some maintenance or other task must occur. I like to think of cumulative on delay timers as little accountants that keep track of how long the controlling input has been asserted and continually monitor how much time remains in the bank before it activates the output. Note for this general purpose orientation, I've purposely simplified the timing diagram for cumulative on delay timers. To be sure there are other timer functions and twisted offspring of unholy unions of these common functions. However, these are more than likely the most common timer functions you'll run across. This orientation is intended to be general in nature and does not dive into specifics nor manufacture idiosyncrasies. Be aware of subtle differences in different terminology used to describe the same features. Long story short, RTFM. The classic introductory example of an on-delay timer is the time-shifted response of pilot lights. Note the three-wire control circuit in rungs one and two serves to simultaneously energize the coil of a regular control relay, CR1, and the coil of a timer relay, TR1. Contact CR1A, associated with a regular control relay, serves only as a holding contact allowing the circuit to maintain the last asserted state. Rung 3 contains a normally closed time open contact TR1A associated with timer relay. Rung 4 contains contact TR1B, a normally open time closed contact associated with the timer relay. Let's assume the timer executing the on delay function is set to execute a 5 second delay. Note the start state of this circuit is red light on, green light off. When an operator presses the start push button, both the coil of control relay CR1 and timer relay TR1 are energized. Contact CR1A immediately switches to the activated closed state and establishes a holding circuit. An operator can release the start push button. In contrast, the on delay contacts associated with timer relay TR1 do not immediately change states. TR1A remains closed and TR1B remains open. The red light remains on and the green light remains off only after the predetermined delay period of one, two, three, four, five seconds has elapsed do these on delay contacts change states. TR1A opens and TR1B closes. The red light turns off and the green light turns on five seconds after the controlling input was energized. When an operator presses, and releases stop, both control relay CR1 and timer relay TR1 coils are de-energized and all associated contacts immediately return to their deactivated state. CR1A opens removing the holding circuit, TR1A closes, TR1B opens. The red light is on, the green light is off. We have returned to the start state of our system. Again, note the timer relay delayed the transition of the associated contacts and thus the response of the pilot lights for a period of five seconds after the start button was pressed. Note if an operator were to press and release start and then immediately press and release stop prior to the delay period elapsing, the timer would clear and reset. 
consider this slightly modified circuit, further illustrating this fact. Note we've ditched the regular control relay CR1 and the holding contact CR1A. CR1A has been replaced with TR1H, yet another normally open time-closed contact associated with the timer relay TR1. Let's assume the on-delay period is again set to 5 seconds. If you truly understand the behavior of an on-delay timer, you should be able to predict how this circuit works given the following two scenarios. First, when an operator presses and immediately releases the start push button, and two, when an operator presses and holds the start push button closed for a period of longer than five seconds. By all means, pause the lecture and think about this. If you're tracking, here's how the circuit responds to the first scenario, when an operator presses and immediately releases the start push button. Long story short, it doesn't. If an operator presses and releases the start push button, the coil of the timer relay is only momentarily energized, and when energized, starts initiating the five second countdown. However, the moment the operator releases the start push button, the coil of timer relay TR1 is de-energized and the countdown is reset back to zero. The second scenario is different. Only when an operator presses and holds the start push button for a period of longer than the predetermined one, two, three, four, five seconds, do the associated contacts change states. TR1H, the holding contact, closes and establishes the holding circuit. Additionally, TR1A opens and TR1B closes. An operator can now release the start push button. The red light is off, the green light is on. The difference being an operator had to be patient enough to press and hold the button for a period of 5 seconds, thereby giving them a full 5 seconds to contemplate if this is really, 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 really really what they mean to do. The stop button serves to de-energize the coil of timer relay TR1 and thus return the system to its start state. Red light on, green light off. I think this is a pretty fun example circuit that illustrates not only the function, but also the utility of on-delay timers. Note this particular circuit required the timer relay coil be continuously energized for a period of 5 seconds before the lights flip-flop and the holding circuit was established. We'll examine another function called a cumulative on-delay timer in later lectures that maintains a running tally of elapsed time despite discontinuous assertion of the controlling input. Besides making some stupid lights blink, a timer relay can also be used to perform synchronization of separate industrial tasks. For example, consider an electrically controlled hydraulic system that must extend cylinder A on demand, then after a 5 second dwell period, extend cylinder B. The ladder logic controlling this circuit might look something like this. The three-wire control circuit in rungs 1 and 2 serves to energize the coil of a regular control relay CR1 and the coil of a timer relay TR1. Contact CR1H associated with a regular control relay serves as a holding contact, allowing the circuit to maintain the last asserted state. Note the inclusion of a maintained e-stop that serves to de-energize the whole system. Rung 3 contains a regular, normally open contact, CR1A, associated with a regular control relay, CR1, in series with solenoid A. Rung 4, in contrast, contains a normally open, time-closed contact, TR1B, associated with timer relay, TR1, in series with solenoid B. Note CR1H, CR1A, will respond immediately, whereas TR1B will do so only after the delay period T has elapsed. When an operator presses the start push button, the coil of CR1 and TR1 are both energized. The contacts associated with control relay CR1 immediately change states. CR1H closes and establishes a holding circuit, allowing an operator to release the start push button. CR1A closes and energizes solenoid A. DCVA shifts to the straight through position and cylinder A extends. TR1B, in contrast, does not immediately change to its opposite state, but rather remains open, and solenoid B remains de-energized. Once a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 second delay has elapsed, the normally open time-closed contact TR1B closes and energizes solenoid B. DCVB shifts to the straight-through position, and cylinder B extends. In this scenario, the cylinders would remain extended. 
Note that the accumulator and check valve on the pressure line leading to DCVA ensures that while cylinder B is in the act of extending, it does not interfere with the force exerted by cylinder A. This additional directional control valve is intended to provide a means of safely discharging the accumulator in the event the system needs to be serviced. Additionally note our pump is a pressure compensated variable displacement pump that de-strokes to zero gallons per minute at the firing pressure, conveniently set that below the main pressure relief valve. The high pressure standby mode of the pressure compensated variable displacement pump thus keeps the main pressure relief valve closed and allows both cylinders A and B to exert continual force at the limits of travel. Sorry for the side trip to hydraulics land. Ordinarily, I try to stick to exclusively electrical control topics or exclusively hydraulic topics, depending on the focus of the particular lecture. However, I do sometimes succumb to temptation to mix the two. Those individuals interested in parallel hydraulic circuits, accumulators, and pressure compensated variable displacement pumps and more are encouraged to check out the hydraulics and electrical control of hydraulic systems playlist available at the Big Bad Tech channel. If an operator to press and release the stop button, both control relay CR1 and timer relay TR1 coils are de-energized and all associated contacts immediately return to their deactivated state. When CRH opens up, it removes the holding circuit. When CR1A opens, it de-energizes solenoid A. When TR1B opens, it de-energizes solenoid B. Both spring offset directional control valves shift to the cross-connect position and cylinders A and B retract. We've returned to the start state of our system. Again, note the contacts associated with the regular control relay, CR1H, CR1A, responded as soon as control relay CR1's coil was energized, whereas the contact associated with the timer relay, TR1B, responded only after a period of five seconds after timer relay TR1's coil was energized. Note we can modify our existing electrically controlled hydraulic system to include additional functionality. On the hydraulic side, we've included a limit switch on cylinder B. Limit switch B senses when the rod makes contact at cylinder B's limit of extension. On the electrical control side, the normally closed side of limit switch B takes the place of the stop button. The behavior of this system is essentially the repeat of the previous example. However, upon an operator pressing and releasing the start button, the system performs a complete sequence and returns to the start state without an operator's continued involvement. Allow me to demonstrate. When an operator presses start, CR1 and TR1 are both energized. The contacts associated with CR1 immediately change states, whereas the contact associated with TR1 begins a five second countdown. The closure of CR1A shifts directional control valve A to the straight through position and cylinder A extends. After a delay period of one, two, three, four, five seconds, TR1B closes and energizes the solenoid of directional control valve B. Directional control valve B shifts to the straight through position and cylinder B extends. When cylinder B strikes limit switch B at the limits of travel, limit switch B opens and de-energizes CR1 and TR1. All associated contacts immediately return to their deactivated state. CR1H opens and removes the holding contact. CR1A opens de-energizing the solenoid of directional control valve A. Tier 1B opens, de-energizing the solenoid of directional control valve B. The spring offset valves return to their deactivated cross-connect position and the rods retract. Note when rod B retracts from the reset region of limit switch B, the normally closed side of limit switch B recloses and returns us to the start state of our system. Again, note the contact associated with the timer relay, Tier 1B, responded only five seconds after timer relay TR1's coil was energized. This circuit could be used to clamp and press an object for a period of five seconds with cylinder A prior to being punched or bent by cylinder B. The limit switch ensures the system returns to the start state only after cylinder B has completed the required travel. The substitution of the normally closed limit switch in place of the normally closed stop push button therefore allows the system to automatically execute a complete one cycle reciprocation including a dwell period at the touch of a single button. Moving on, timers are not exclusively used in electrically controlled hydraulic systems, but can also be used to coordinate the activity of electric motors. Consider a simple motor-driven conveyor belt system with two sections, A and B. At the start of the day, both belts are empty, and then a production line starts dropping boxes onto the far end of belt A. 
Given boxes only get on the belt at the very far end of A, and belt B is empty, it'd be kind of wasteful to spin section B until something was placed on it. Given it would take a predictable amount of time for a box placed at one end of A to reach the other, conveyor belt B could delay starting a time period after belt B has been energized. This sounds like a perfect application for an on-delay timer. The ladder logic coordinating this simple system might look something like this. The three-wire control circuit in rungs 1 and 2 serve to energize the coil of contactor A and the coil of timer relay TR1. Contact A1, an auxiliary contact associated with contactor A, serves as a holding contact, allowing the circuit to maintain the last asserted state. Rung 3 contains a normally open time-closed contact, TR1B, associated with timer relay TR1 in series with the coil of contactor B. No overloads for motor A and motor B are in series with one another and serve to de-energize the whole system if one or both overloads detect a sustained overload condition. Additionally note the maintained e-stop serves to de-energize the whole system. When our operator presses and releases the start button, the coil of both contactor A and timer relay TR1 are energized. Contactor A closes and belt A springs to life. Note A1, the auxiliary contact associated with contactor A immediately responds and establishes a holding circuit. This allows an operator to release the start button. TR1B, in contrast, remains open because the timer relay TR1 is still counting down the delay period. After the predetermined period of time has elapsed, the normally open time closed contact TR1B closes and energizes the coil of contactor B just as the box tumbles onto belt B. Contactor B closes and motor B springs to life, ushering the first box placed on belt A along to its intended destination. As can be expected, an operator pressing and releasing the stop push button would de-energize both contactor coil A and B, as well as timer relay coil TR1, and return the system to its original start state. Note, as currently implemented, this system only bases the decision to start belt B on time, not in reality. If the system was started with a box located in the middle of belt A, rather than the far end, or stopped in mid-travel and then started again, the box would reach belt B sooner than expected. Add to this, the nightmare scenario of box after box piling up at the transition point and spilling onto the floor. An especially dangerous scenario if you happen to be making scorpions at a scorpion factory. Long story short, this example is not meant to be a robust or proven industrial application, but rather familiarize the viewers with the advantages and notable shortcomings of on-delay timer applications. Expect us to revisit similar applications in later lectures, allowing for smoother transitions and more desirable performance. All right, that is that for this lecture. I was going to dive into on-delay timers coordinating reduced voltage starters. However, I think I'm going to hold that off for another entire lecture since it comes with some associated baggage, notably an understanding of reduced voltage starters. If you are equipped for this journey, by all means proceed to the reduced voltage starters using timers lecture, but if not, here's a preview. The most basic application of on-delay timers is for scenarios in which one or more contacts must open or close a measurable time period after an input has been asserted. Recall that primary resistor, part winding, and Y start delta run reduced voltage starters are all characterized by two distinct stages, start and run, and they necessitate a reconfiguration during the transition. Additionally, some types of solid state soft starters specifically those that are AC53B rated, must be bypassed during the run stage and given a chance to cool. All these applications are perfectly suited for on-delay timers, a timer function that delays the transition of associated contacts a predetermined period of time after the controlling input has been asserted. By all means, check this lecture out if you've got the time. Pun intended. In conclusion, this lecture took a brief look at timers and the on-delay function. We learned the difference between single and multifunction timers, discussed the methods timers use to determine delay period, compared and contrasted general timer functions with one another, learned how to set up an example timer to perform the on-delay function, and finally employed a timer executing the on-delay function in several illustrated examples. Remember to review these concepts as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest, and we'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your lazy lab partner about this resource, and be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.